Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's, uh, let's go to the 21st Psalm. We're going to... Um, you know, it is our healing right? so we're going we're to bring healing into this. Hallelujah. And... Um, but we're going to leave here and go to the uh, 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, 22nd Psalm, is, we, we know, I mean, 21st Psalm, I apologize. Uh, no, 22nd, 22nd. It, the 22nd Psalm is a Psalm of the Crucifixion. Um, I remember, some of you remember, uh, guess who, the guess who, doing a song and quoting a good portion of this in that song. Anybody remember that song? Uh, I forgot what song it was by the Guess Who, but it was one of their songs. That they started quoting this at the end of the song. They're playing out, and they start uh, saying, you know, my heart is melting in the midst of my bowels. I mean, they, they quoted, uh, and I don't know why they did it, but it's the, from the old Guess Who. Who remembers who the Guess Who were? Okay. All right. You remember that song? Okay. Yeah, it's been a long time since I heard the Guess Who. Um, I think the only song I really remember is American Woman. <laughs> Because <laughs> they were a Canadian group. <laughs> and it wasn't a positive song about the American woman. Hallelujah. Um, the 22nd Psalm is a, is, is a depiction of Jesus on the cross. And, and down in verse 16 it says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You know, 1,500 years or so before crucifixion became a form of execution by the Romans. Um, we also have in Zechariah um, 12, 10, it says, They looked on him whom they pierced. So again, but, what, a millennia or so before crucifixion became a form of execution by the Romans. And so we, we have Jesus on the cross being our sin substitute. Um, we have in the 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, Paul rebuking the Corinthians for not partaking correctly of the Lord's table. Um, when you come together in one place, verse 20, therefore, and I mean, therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. That they were supposed to be, but they were getting greedy. Uh, they weren't doing it the right way. Uh, for one, in, in eating, everyone taketh before other his humper, supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. So apparently Paul's already talked to them about this. Um, hallelujah. And um, literally, actually, there's, there is the belief this is really the second letter to the Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is really the fourth letter, that Paul wrote a letter prior to this, and Paul wrote a letter in between. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of speculation, and, and internal things in the letters lead uh, scholars to believe that. So he says, you know, I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto. So Paul's already talked to them about this. <clears throat> this the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it, and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, not a cup, but the cup, which when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament or new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft, for as, oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And we're just going to kind of stop right here. I know there's more we could read. We, we would typically do so in a communion service. Uh, but I, I want to um, discuss the Lord's table. Now, the Lord's table was a, a parallel event to Passover. When the, you know, when, remember when Jesus was saying this, it was the Passover meal. And the Passover meal was the remembrance meal of the deliverance of the children out of Egypt. And, you know, actually, uh, it was the death angel passing over them. 
It was the last thing that happened before they were released out of Egypt. Remember, um, you know, God uh, brought the judgment on them and said the firstborn in, in all the land would die unless they had the blood over the, uh, over the mantle and on the lentils of the door. Um, and um, that was also symbolic because the way they did it, uh, when they brought the blood and hyssop and they, um, they came to the doors and they ap applied it on the, across the head and on the sides, um, you know, the blood would run. And so you have blood dripping from here to the ground. If you were to draw parallel lines, you would have I mean, I mean, straight lines or, uh, well, not parallel, but a line here. And a line from this one to this one, from point A to point B, and point B, A to P, you've created a cross. So, you know, anybody that was in there was safe. All right, that's how they did it. So if you drew the line from where the blood was at the top and where it dropped to the bottom, where the blood was on the two sides, across, you had a cross. You know, and there was safety there. The cross brings a safety. Blood was shed to provide deliverance. Amen? Remember Jesus had a crown of thorns, which would be the head. The hands were pierced or nailed on the sides, and then his feet were, hang, were, were pierced. And so blood there. So we, we have that there in just that, in that, um, that night the death angel came, we have the, the uh, allegory of Jesus on the cross providing the safety and refuge from the judgment of God and which was to come on all those who were outside of that place. All right? <clears throat> so... And they were, they were, they were receiving, um, and so they, they instituted a um, time, and then that time was the first one, was the Passover meal. But um, historically, the Jews uh, would receive that meal, and they would have an um, unleavened bread. And in that unleavened bread, they would have three loaves, or, or we wouldn't really call them loaves because they were flat, like flat bread. Um, <clears throat> because it was unleavened, you had, it, had, it had to be cooked, you know, it's, crack, it's a cracker, basically like a cracker. That's how, you know, or, or even a, a tortilla or whatever, something that cooks flat. But anything that cooks flat, when you cook it, you notice uh, it, it develops ridges and, and, and browns uh, unevenly, so you get stripes, okay? And, uh, and like in a cracker, in order to make it cook thoroughly through, they have to pierce it to make it, you know, so uh, you, you get crackers. They got holes. Why they got holes in them? I mean, they got holes down the sides because in order to make it cook properly or to cook fully, you have to pierce it so the heat rises through it properly and that kind of thing. <coughs> so they would have three loaves now, and they would put them in a special pouch. And the pouch was th three of them, and uh, they they referred to those Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They always believe. And the, and the interesting thing is, when Jews receive receive the Passover meal, they serve uh, Isaac first. They don't know why. But well, duh, we do, because it's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, Jesus was the Son. Um, also, in that meal, you would have um, chalices at the table, uh, and they would they would pour the the wine or the grape juice. You know, or the same words used in the Greek and new wine, or you know, fermented or unfermented, uh, fully fully fermented and and and, and just grape juice. Um, Really, the context tells us, be not drunk with wine. We know that's not talking about drinking uh, unfermented grape juice. You can't get drunk on unfermented grape juice. But um, you, you just don't really know unless contextually what you're studying, whether, which one they mean. Because the word's used interchangeably. Uh, for each, to refer, really, to the, to the fruit of the vine or, the, or, or to the um, blood of the vine, the, the, the wine. Okay? So they, don't have, they didn't have a distinction between wine and grape juice. We do. We call it grape juice. Okay? Or cider. Sparkling cider, you know, you get sparkling cider. They carbonate it, you know, they give it bubbles, this, but it's unfermented. Down at the bottom, they'll say non-alcoholic, no alcohol, no alcohol content, etc. Um, if you go to my house, you might see a bottle of sparkling red grape juice on my counter. It's unfermented. It's non-alcoholic. If you see me with built more boxes, it's the it's the red grape juice uh, or the um, uh, Concord grape juice with, and, and the uh, the white muscadine grape. I think I think use muscadine grapes for that, but it's just grape juice. Okay. But if you, if, you, if you were trying to describe it to a Jew, you'd say wine. <laughs> it's not fermented, all right? Um, then of course, they have fermented, which we don't bring home, and we don't bring home either way, in a bottle or in our stomachs. We don't do it. Just say it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So um, they, would, they would be drinking the, you know, the, 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 they had their meal, they would be drinking the, the cup, and that, that was to represent the blood uh, of the, you know, of, of, of the lamb. Jesus, is, he said this, it's his blood new covenant. But they would also, but when they did this, they'd have, they'd have a chalice turned upside down, sitting at the table waiting for Messiah to come. 
Messiah was to come, turn the table up, fill it with, fill it with the wine and drink of it, declaring he, who he was. That's, that was their tradition. Messiah would come. And so Jesus is at this meal. You know, they, they take of the centerpiece Isaac, but they you know he, he passes. Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, it's, it's hard. It's in, and differing from a tortilla where they're soft. It's a cracker. It's hard. Okay? He would break it. He broke it. He said, take heed, this is my body. Unlike the church at Rome, we do not believe in transmutation. We do not believe that, that bread literally becomes his flesh. And that wine literally becomes his blood. We don't believe that. Now, they do. I mean, there's, and, and other, other liturgical churches do. They, they believe that it literally becomes the blood and body of Jesus. Uh, that's, as far as I'm concerned, erroneous doctrine. Okay? I, I, you know, it's, it's an allegory. It's a type. It's a foreshadowing. I mean, not a foreshadowing, but it's a type, and it's an allegory. You know, it represents his body. And in every way you can think of, it represents his body. The bread represents his body. By his stripes you're healed. They looked at him whom they pierced. Okay, and so that, that cracker represents the body of the Lord and represents what it did for us. So they would serve that. They're serving that at this meal. And the reason he says, take heat, this is my body. Now, he, he's not literally saying, well, we couldn't be his body because his body's sitting right there. Okay, it's allegorical. It's, it's in a typology. This represents my broken body for you, you know, which is what we're after. Well, what it represents. His body was broken by his stripes. We've been healed. So when we're at the communion table, we are partaking of what Jesus said, take it, this is my body which is broken for you. The stripes and the piercings, so the piercings on the cross, the stripes for your healing, by whose stripes you were healed, Isaiah 53, um, 1 Peter 2, 24. We have that as, a cl as clear as we can get it, that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. We were healed by him carrying this, uh, on his body the, the wounds and the bruises and the, and the stripes and all the sicknesses laid on him for us. He bore it to the cross. Why? To take it from us. It was never God, it's never been God's intent for man to be sick. Why? He's the Lord that heals us. Okay? He is our healer. And so they're, they're at this meal. Jesus says, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. So establishing. And, and, and what, is it, what does Jesus say um, in verse 25? As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you, verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Um, what's he doing? He is establishing a, a, a table of remembrance of a covenant for you. In other words, when you eat the bread of the communion table, you are reminded that Jesus bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases. It is a reminding meal. Um, if you've ever read the book by H. Clay Trumbull, it, it's, I don't even know if it's still in print or not, uh, called The Blood Covenant. Um, and, and then, of course, we, it's another book to read with that is E.W. Kenyon's book, The Blood Covenant. It's a small mini book, okay? Not, not as small as what maybe Faith Library puts out, but a little bit, but it's still a small mini book. And he, he refers to that book often um, um, because Trumbull, in his book, did a study on Blood Covenant and studied many of the ancient rites of covenanting. And in court, court, uh, of course, in doing so, he covered the travels of Stanley and Livingston across Africa. I forgot how many covenants they cut, but they cut a, a truckload of covenants with African tribes for protection. Okay? I mean, the very, the very purpose of it was, you know, they, they, would, they would come and they would make a covenant with a tribe, make a blood covenant where they would cut the wrist and they would... And, and, and all over they found out there was different methods of doing it, well, all with the same end. Okay, once you were in covenant, you, you, you uh, carried uh, the protection or the uh, whatever of that tribe. And, you know, them being European visitors to, a, to, a, uh, to Africa, um, they, they were not exactly, uh, you know, uh, uh, a um, welcome item everywhere. So I uh, got one place, Livingston had, had stomach ulcers, and he, the only thing he could drink was goat milk. He had his own goat. Got to one tribe, and, that, and the chieftain wanted his goat. That's the, only thing he, that's the only thing he would take in the covenant deal. Now, what he got in return was a staff with feathers on it. Wow, I need goat milk, I get a staff with feathers on it. But they cut the covenant. And, and the interesting thing was, uh, and, and they're accounting for these blood covenants, 
um, you know, they would come out and, you know, they would, they would begin, they would say, now, we're coming into covenant. And if you're in covenant with us, you know, you have our protection. You have uh, access to all of our, our food. You have access to anything. You know, you're, 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 you're just absolutely protected and covered and whatever by our tribe. But then, the, then the, you know, a lot of times a witch doctor would come out and do this. And when they got done with that, if, and he said, now, if you break the covenant, and he pronounced some of the most god-awful curses you could imagine. I mean, you know, uh, you have emeralds, and you know, the fleas of a thousand, thousand camels will infest your armpits or whatever. Y'all remember that? Maybe, maybe the fleas of a thousand camels will infest your, your armpits. That was an old saying that people used to try to be cute with. But, you know, they would just come out and, and like, put all these curses on you if you broke the covenant. Now, what Livingston didn't know was when they, they left that village and went out, he, he, they, they would encounter different tribes that were ready to kill them. And as soon as they saw that staff, they would stop. Because that was the strongest tribe in that entire region of Africa. And they knew if they touched them people, him carrying the, the chiefs and staff, that they would hunt them down and kill them. He had to give up his goat, but he had, he had as it were, divine protection on all of his travels to that area. Because there wasn't, there, wasn't, there wasn't a tribe who would touch them because of that staff of that chieftain. They knew who they knew whose it was, and they knew what would happen if they touched them. They would come and kill them. That tribe would come and just wipe them out. So, <clears throat> um, but, but in this, we, we found, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trumbull found that, you know, there was, these covenants were so strong. But they had to have their roots in something. Now, now um, when the Catholics came to America... And, and they, saw the, they saw the Native Americans um, cutting blood covenants. They thought it was a very tribal, and um, not tribal, but, um, but um, animalistic almost, ritual and watering down of the table of the Lord. And what they didn't understand was it had its roots in blood covenant. And the blood covenant of, uh, there at, with Jesus was not just instituted at the Lord's Supper. The Holy Eucharist was not just an institution that started on that night. It had been, they had been, David and Jonathan had a blood covenant. God had a blood covenant with, with Abraham. He had a blood covenant with Moses and, 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 the, and the people of Israel. There were different blood covenants cut through all, all throughout. I mean, the people of Israel cut covenants with different, different nations in order to, uh, they, they, they would uh, do things to get a covenant with them to get protection. So when a guy here, this is not some unknown, but covenant started in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned and God slayed the animals to cover their sin and the blood was shed for their sin. It, that, that's where it started. It started way back there. So, but the force of the covenant. I'm telling you, when, when you read Trumbull's book, you find out all over Africa where Stanley and Livingston were traveling. I mean, the force of the covenant was so strong. How strong was it? It would be so strong that in some cases, when a man cut a covenant with another man, that man's wife was part of that other guy's property if he wanted her. If one party failed to keep the covenant, their own family would hunt them down and kill them. I mean, it was a strong, it's strong. Now, do you think that that's by chance? No, God, God's covenant with us. This is the new covenant in my blood. God has a covenant with us. That's why the, holy ta why, why the, why the communion table is a holy, holy place. It's a holy institution, a ritual. It's really, really not a ritual, but a holy ordinance of the church. You can make it a ritual, you just do it, you go through the motions, it becomes ritualistic. But it's an ordinance of the church. It's a doctrine of the church. And Jesus said this, he said, as oft as you drink, eat my flesh, and, and as often as you eat this cup, uh, bread, and drink this cup, you do show my death till I come. What? You are uh, standing, you show my death until I come. The covenant holds us in place between those two events. You show my death. Till I come. Hallelujah. That covenant is holding us in place between those two events. And it's holding us in place with the promises of God. With the assurances of God. With the, what God said he would do. And, he, and, and that he would not uh, dishonor his own word. There is given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. But in those promises and in that covenant... Jesus says, by his stripes, we, you, know, you, know, you know, 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes, we're healed. See, that's in that do we show. So when we come to the communion table and we partake of the bread, we're showing what he did at the cross until he comes. Why? Because when he comes, we're not going to need to be healed. 
We're going to have a glorified body. It won't be susceptible to disease. It won't be susceptible to death. How do you know? The Bible says that when, he, when the, the Lord comes back, this corruptible boy shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So we won't need healing anymore. Why? We'll no longer be death doomed. And we'll no longer have a corrupt body. In other words, susceptible to disease. Susceptible to death. It won't be. It'll be immortal. And it'll be incorruptible. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So what do we do? Well, in this, in this realm and on this time, we, 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 uh, we have bodies that are, that are mortal. You know you have a mortal body? Does anybody know that you got a mortal body? Say, I got a mortal body. Whether you like it or not, you got a mortal body. What's that mean? It's death. It's going to die. Well, I confess that I ain't going to die. Well, either you're, you're confessing you're going to live until Jesus comes back or you're going to die. Don't care. You can't confess it. Why? You have no Bible promise. I said you have no Bible promise. That went over big. Let me say it one more time. You have no Bible promise that you won't die before the Lord comes. I mean, uh, you won't die should the Lord tarry. You have no biblical basis to believe that you will not die. You can let long life. I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. Praise the Lord, but you have no Bible promise that you, will, you have a, an immortal body. Now, some of the teaching of the, the manifested sons of God of the kingdom now kind of taught that we were going to, you know, be manifest as, a son, manifest as sons of God in the earth, and that's, that's what that was all about. That's error. It's not biblical. We can't do that. You can't take things and make things happen that the Bible don't promise you. No, but you can live healthy. Now, some bozos come along and go, you know, well, how are you going to die if you don't get sick? Do like they did in the, throughout in the Bible, in the Old Testament, different things. You know, calling the kids, hey, lay hands on them, bless them or curse them, depending on how they're living, and then take, throw up your feet and go home. There you go. Amen. Just, you know, it's time to go. You go home. I know ministers who say things like, you know, um, I'll see you in heaven, and within a week they're dead. Because they're they ready to go home. They took off. So... We have a covenant table. So here we are. We're in the covenant table. Jesus is sitting with the disciples. He serves Isaac and says, this is my body. So what do we do? When we take the communion table, we're talking about the body of the Lord. We, we accept the body of the Lord. We declare that uh, we, we receive the stripes of Jesus. By his stripes, we're healed. And we, every time we take the table, we're being reminded we have a covenant of healing. Glory to God. And then Jesus, after that, said, took the cup. I believe he reached over and took Messiah's cup, turned it up, filled it, said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Hallelujah. Declaring that he's Messiah. Glory to God. Amen. This, this is the New Testament in my blood. His blood was shed. I don't believe I'm drinking his blood when I partake of the communion table. His blood's on the mercy seat of heaven. I said his blood's on the mercy seat of heaven. Well, he said it's, you know, no, it's allegorical. It's just like, you know, all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. They don't have any hands. Are you here? The Bible uses typology and allegories to, uh, you know, the stones are going to cry out. If we, if, if, if we don't cry out and honor, uh, uh, sing Hosanna to God, the rocks themselves will cry out. He's talking in typology. He's not talking in literal, literalism. You have to know that there's things in the Bible that are that are typical that are type of they're allegorical and in, ty in, in types they are not literal. Amen. All right. So we're at the communion table. Jesus takes and, and takes the bread, breaks it, said, "This is my body. Do it in remembrance of me." Takes the cup and serves it. And says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Here again, in remembrance of me. Being reminded of what takes place at that table, at that time, in that institution, in that, in that ordinance of the church, we are receiving in us the workings of the new covenant. We have healing promised to us. We have not only healing promised to us, it's ratified in a covenant. By the blood of Jesus, glory to God. You know, under the old covenant, when they, when they finished reading the law, they took blood and hyssop and sprinkled the law. It was uh, declaring it was sealed in blood. Hello. 
Here, Jesus' own blood was, was, was sprinkled on, uh, on this promise, glory to God, on the mercy seat of God. It is, say, it is his declaration of the steadfastness of his covenant towards us. It's sealed in blood. Everybody say, it's sealed in blood. What's sealed in blood? Healing belongs to us. That's one of the things. You know, that's not the only thing, but that's one of the things. Healing has been procured. Healing has been ratified. Healing has been settled in this covenant between you to show his death until they come. So the covenant of healing will operate from the time of his death to the time of his coming when the church is captured and called away uh, or the establishment of the second, you know, you know, whether you believe in the rapture or when Jesus comes back, you know, however his millennial reign. At that time, when we, leave, when we, when we put on immortal, uh, immortal, incorruptible bodies, the covenant of healing won't be necessary anymore. And everybody says glory to God. Glory to God. Neither will Weight Watchers. Hallelujah. Our Nutrisystem or whoever else, you know, is, after your money with them seven meals a day. Glory to God. Amen. It's a joke, guys. All right. Hallelujah. So, um, the, I, I, the Lord just this afternoon, I was, I was thinking about how I, how I was going to minister on healing or what I was going to do. And he just said, just share on the table. So we've, we've heard, you know, we've heard the scriptures, you know, 10 reasons why Jesus heals or, you know, uh, healing belongs to all or Psalm 103, you know, it's one of his benefits. It's the benefit of God. We've heard 1 Peter 2, 24, Isaiah 53, 5. We've heard the, the, the definition of sozo and soterius, you know, how they, they include healing for the physical body and the Greek word of the sozo group. Um, we, you know, we go on and on and on and on. And he just wanted us to be reminded tonight that at the communion table, healing is part of the covenant because it represents what Jesus did in such a, a, a um, clear depiction so that we can't miss it unless you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee and you're on the Sanhedrin Council or you're a Jewish priest who had all the, the if, you, if, you take, if you took an overview from the top over the layout of the tabernacle and then ultimately the temple, all the furniture is arranged in a cross. Draw lines between the, the, the furnitures or the furnishings of the, of the temple. It creates a cross. Pretty cool. How they're, how they're, God made it so easy they couldn't miss it without help. And apparently they had a bunch of help. <laughs> Amen. I mean, Jesus came, but they, they ready to throw him off a cliff. And here he is. He's the, he's the layout of the temple. He's the cross. Amen. He's the door by which men enter in. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And so the ratification of this covenant by his blood. Now, I got news for you. It didn't, God didn't stop healing folks the day the last apostle died. Nor did he stop healing people because they had, you know, they had the canon of the scripture uh, set aside. You can take 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and misconstrue that all day long if you want to, but you're being dishonest. When that which is perfect has come has nothing to do with the canon of scripture. How do you do it? Because Paul said, I'll know even as I am known. He, he said in that event, when the event takes place, that when that which is perfect is come, I will know even as I am known. How many know even as you're known? Thank you for those no hands. Because there's not a person in this room that knows even as he is known. Amen. We still see through a glass darkly. We see in part. We prophesy in part. We know in part. We don't know fully. Why? Because that which is perfect has not come. That is, you know, the establishment of his kingdom here on the earth as he designed it. You know, the church being captured out. You know, the, you know whichever one of these events you want to go, it's the rapture of the church or the church being caught up with the Lord. You know, so should we ever be with the Lord. Uh, whether you don't believe in the rapture or do you do believe in the rapture of Jesus' second coming is really his third coming. God, I mean, whatever. At, th th at that time when we are, uh, we are under the authority of the King of Kings and Lord Lords literally, Hallelujah. In, 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 in an immortal, incorruptible body. Hallelujah. That which is perfect will come. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 John, I believe it is, when he shall appear, we shall be as he is, for we will see, we'll see him as he is. 
That's that see? We'll be as he is. Oh. First John 3 2. Beloved now, uh, we, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now you got people around saying we're just like, no. I got a, I got a mortal body. I got a corruptible body. But John said, when he appears. When he appears. Now, if I put this in conjunction with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm getting a different view of what that we see through a glass darkly. For then we shall know even as we are known. Can't be talking about the canonicity of Scripture. It's the return of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. And at that time, you won't need healing anymore. You'll be, your body won't be susceptible to it. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I remember a number of years ago, I was listening to this guy on the radio talking about, yeah, I'm telling you, you know, your armor of God is for when you get to heaven, and you're going to walk into heaven with the whole armor on, you know, you're ready. you have never used it on the earth. Now you get to heaven, you're going, where's the devil? And God says, he ain't here. That was for the earth, not here. The armor of God's not for heaven, it's for the earth. It was Copeland. I didn't know who it was at the time. I was just listening to somebody on the radio. I had just gotten saved. I just turned the radio on. There's this guy preaching away about the armor of God in heaven. People dying, you know, and God telling them, they, you don't need it here. It's for, it's for the earth. And Brother Copeland back in 1979, I was listening to that. Right after Brother Bill. Brother Bill got himself sandwiched down there on WBZQ, I believe it was. WBZQ, AM Radio in Greenville, North Carolina. He got sandwiched between Copeland and Hagen. Yeah, he said that, that's a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. he, he was the filler in the Copeland Hagen. Hallelujah. So what are we going to do? When we, when we come to the, ta the table of the Lord, when we come to the communion table, we're going to receive what we have need of in the realm of health and healing because it's part of our covenant. It's been ratified by him. Jesus has told us it's his body. It, it's, it's, it types his body. Therefore, it types what his body does. As you eat this bread, you do show the Lord's death till they come. You do it in remembrance of him. I'm reminded at Calvary, he took my sickness. And I have a covenant of health and healing until he comes. And at that point, I won't need that covenant of health and healing anymore. I have a glorified body. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, did you get anything out of that? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we bless the people. Thank you they're blessed. And uh, we thank you that they receive from you and receive what they have need of. Now, we have this prayer cloth, Lord, for Ben. We pray over this, Father. We thank you for the covenant of divine healing. We thank you for, uh, as you said um, in your word, you, you wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Well, Father, we know that our ministry has that anointing on it, so we lay hands on this cloth. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.